Gentlemen, welcome to Five Nights at Freddy's. The Silver Eyes. Wait, our channel is all about horror games. Why the hell are we reading a damn book? It assists our understanding of the games, especially in the later installments. So we're reading the entire novel? Let's just hope Balloon Boy isn't in it. Don will spend the next five recording sessions complaining about him. We wouldn't make it to a fifth game. Regardless, I think it's important to clarify that I'll be approaching this the same way I approached the lore explanation. What do you mean? I'll be summarizing the key points that occur. Reading out the dialogue would be too long for it to really work. Can't wait to see what jigsaw puzzle awaits us in this book. Now, before we jump into this, I want to clarify that timelines are officially introduced here. Certain key events that line up here will contradict events from the games. However, it also offers information that we haven't known of prior. Basically, these books serve as an alternate universe to the video games. I have something to say. Okay, we're waiting. What? You said you were going to say something. Yeah, I said it. What? Let's start off with the very beginning. The story follows a young woman named Charlotte Emily, or Charlie. She's heading back to her hometown to attend a memorial of her childhood friend, Michael. In that town, she meets with her friends, Marla, Jason, Carlton, Lamar, Jessica, and John. You just gave out the cast of Seinfeld like it was nothing. Interesting way to start off the book, I suppose. And now this is where it gets good. Because of persistent trauma, Charlie has flashbacks throughout the novel that reveal her upbringing. During her childhood, she had a twin brother named Sammy. Her father, Henry, was the owner of Fred Bear's family diner. So this is the pig stain that thought it was smart to run a butcher shop disguised as a jungle gym. I don't uh, know how much to take into thought considering this was a uh, separate universe. Does he own the restaurants and the games too? Yes, but it's not full ownership. He owned it with a man named William Afton. A joint business, if you will. Exactly. Sounds like Dumb and Dumber really didn't know what the hell was going on. Now, if you remember, we loop back to the spring suits. Henry invented those for employees to wear while entertaining customers. One night at a Halloween party on October 31st in 1982, Charlie and her brother were playing in the closet when a man dressed up as Spring Bonnie shows up and snatches Sammy. Her brother is never found. What a damn segue that was. We went from casual dress-up day to Lindbergh kidnapping. There's too many incidents with kids to count now. I can't even keep track. After this takes place, Henry and his family move to another town where he opens Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, this time with more animatronics. This cast includes Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy. So what happens to the old location? Didn't Golden Fred Bear crush the crying child's head? Like I said, while there are some parallels to this universe, there is still stuff that's up in the air. Yeah, like rational thought. Now we're still in this flashback scenario here. So things are smooth for a while until three years later in 1985, when someone begins killing innocent children. Out of five children, one of the victims was Charlie's friend, Michael. At least this all gives us concrete timing to when this all occurred. I just want to know what light bulb flickered in Henry's noggin to open up another restaurant. Now, around this time, spooky things are happening at Charlie's house as well. She mentions that an invention of her father's begins walking around the house. An endoskeleton, which is the interior wiring and circuitry of an animatronic. The insides, right? Yes, but it's a metal body that acts as support for the movements and functions of the animatronic. Uh, a skeleton, if you will. Just polish off the blood stains and you might have something for the carnival. Side note here is that she reveals that this endoskeleton would actually become Foxy. Never mind. Let Disney assign him a liberal agenda or something. Not long after, Charlie's father dies, although it's unclear there was an endoskeleton near his body. I'll go into more detail later. Well, that's a pretty big thing to just skim over for now. Aren't we a bit all over the place? Again, I'm explaining all the flashbacks in one go, then getting on to the main story. Back to the missing kids. It was actually Carlton's dad, Clay, that was assigned the investigation when everything went down. They originally suspected Henry because his child had gone missing at the previous location. However, Clay didn't concur. He actually suspected Henry's partner, William Afton. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but whoever is suspected of these murders is also known as the purple guy. Right? If we're looking into things from the game's perspective, yes. 
Now that they know the guy, time to burn him at the stake. It was said that Clay had aligned the dots to the case. A search of his house had implied evidence against William for being the criminal. However, there was simply nothing outside of circumstantial evidence. Without any bodies, there couldn't be a charge. William Afton left town and they didn't even know where he had gone. The Springfield Police Department could have done a better job than this. What police department? The cops from the Simpsons. Wow, yeah, that's embarrassing. Jump back to the present day. After Charlie meets up with her friends, they decide to go back to the old site of the restaurant. Yeah, because going back to a slaughterhouse is a great idea, the best idea. They went back to relive the good memories of their childhood, I suppose. The word good is a questionable one at best. Uh, when they arrive, they find a construction site for a mall. Assisted by a large pile of gravel, they climb over the sides of the building. The building itself was half built, looking to be abandoned. Somewhere along their trip to the old site, they see a flashlight casting nearby, possibly from a security guard. However, the source of the light vanishes into the dark. Wait, what the hell? So there's a whole mall there, but they're still trying to find the old place? It probably got demolished. Why would they just let it sit in a mall? You really haven't learned from the first games, have you? Quit being an ape. Logic doesn't exist here. I hope Jeremy, or whoever the security guard is, gives them hell. Eventually, they find the wall to Freddy's. The door to the old place was hidden behind a large shelf. Going back inside, they were able to relive some of the memories they had there. Everything was as it was. Party tables, decorations, and even the animatronics themselves were still there. Now my rocket is getting completely John Eltoned. There's just no way any sane contractor would just let all of that sit, especially very expensive metals. Horrible business practices. You might as well just keep talking, Joe, because Don will keep jumping down the rabbit hole of realism. After that cave digging they did, they went back to the hotel room for the night. The next morning, they meet with more of their friends to attend the ceremony that I mentioned earlier. The one for her friend that died 10 years prior, right? Yep, as the ceremony left everybody in high emotions, they decided to leave early, but overhearing what they did at the mall, Marla insists they go back to Freddy's as she did not attend the first time. Yeah, let's honor Michael's memory by having a party at the place he got butchered. Back inside the mall, they almost get caught by the security guard stationed there. Jason claimed he even got flashed by the light, but the guard chose to ignore him. Must be Don on patrol. The world's best security guard would never. Back near Freddy's, they find a separate door that leads to a room with a control panel. They're able to turn the electricity on and even get the animatronics running. Have we learned nothing from what happened? Clearly these kids cut classes. I'm surprised they just have zero problem breaking and entering. There could have been squatters in there for all they know. Squatters would be the best case scenario. They notice that it doesn't show all of the cameras. So they go hunting for another control panel and eventually find it. It had monitors that displayed the rest of the layout plus controls to Pirate Cove. Smartest stoners, I suppose. Speaking of Pirate Cove, Charlie and John start playing hide and seek when she finds herself inside of Foxy's curtain. The claw comes down on her arm and slices it to all hell. They go back to the motel to get first aid. Now, most normal people take that as a sign to stop playing with toasters past their warranty. So to reminisce on the good times, they break into this place not once, but twice and then get injured in the process? You would think there, were, there would be alternative routes to nostalgia. Now don't tell me they return back there again. Probably wouldn't be a book for a reason. The next day, after some bonding time with John, Charlie recalls the original diner where the trauma began. John suggests they go back to the original town to try to find it, and they do. Inside the original building, Charlie has flashbacks of when Sammy was taken and noted that it was a golden bear. John chimes in and notes that the night Michael was taken, it was also a golden bear. Charlie concludes that the two must be connected, despite the gap in years. A lot of names that are dropping here. I'll pretend to recognize who they are. The gang meets up back at the old mall, but while they go back inside, the security guard actually confronts them. The security guard introduces himself as Dave. Dave orders them to leave the premises and Charlie bargains that if he comes with them to the restaurant, they'll never come back. A deal is made as they go back to the restaurant. I think I've seen less corruption in Vice City. I think I've seen less corruption in the government of Venezuela, let alone Vice City. Inside the restaurant, Charlie notices that Dave is a bit of a character. Not only does he have oddly similar scars on both sides of his neck, 
but he gets the animatronics to have a perfect stance, first try even. I don't know about the scars, but the fact that he was able to set up the animatronics so easily is certainly something. Old Dave here might be more than just a creepy stalker security guard. Jason heads off to find a certain drawing of Bonnie. Now while Dave is around the animatronics, Bonnie starts losing it and convulsing everywhere. Within the commotion, two things occur. Carlton gets knocked to the floor and Dave disappears. They split up and try to find him. Things are getting a bit too weird for my liking. This is Mr. Bean level of shenanigans. Meanwhile, Dave ends up at the office, which he has a key for. He opens a locker which has the infamous golden Bonnie suit in it. Afterwards, he starts stalking the kids. It's almost like this all could have been avoided if they didn't try to, to trespass. Bad situations are sourced from bad company after all. Carlton ends up on the chopping block as he's assaulted by the golden Bonnie and dragged away by Dave. Jason bears witness and flees to tell the group what happens. The problem is that they don't believe him due to the fact that Bonnie is still on stage. I don't think this would be classified as a prank. We are in the age of TikTok. Yeah, but this was in the 90s. We are in the realm of stupidity. John still concludes that they need to get help. Outside of the mall, they get a cop to call the chief of police after he finds out it's the chief's own son that is missing. It's that clay fellow that I mentioned earlier. Well, what kind of horrible police officer would just blow someone off if they weren't high authority? Remember Springfield police. I guess it makes sense. The cop escorts them all to Clay's house, who has them stay the night and make them breakfast in the morning. He's not that overly concerned about the disappearance of his son. Are you serious? Dead serious, no pun intended. Are you sure his name isn't Fred? Funny enough, his wife gets really upset with him that Carlin is missing to which Clay's excuse was that he thought it was a silly prank. He sends out the same officer to check the scene. I'm surprised he would even have a wife after what he did. I don't even want to imagine the hell I would go through if I pulled that around Donna. Neither do I, and it's not even my wife. As the officer gets there, he notices the door to Freddy's is opened. However, before he can make another move, Dave attacks the officer and butchers him with a knife. He then hides the body. The media would just say he was providing for his family. While all this goes down, Charlie and John go back to her old house to search for any pieces of evidence. They find an old picture of her father in the Freddy suit, along with someone else in the yellow Bonnie suit. Following up at the library, they find a news article about her missing brother. In the article is a picture of her father and another man claiming they are both co-owners of the restaurant. Immediately after, Marla bursts in claiming Jason has gone missing possibly going back to Freddy's to find Carlton. There's a lot to unpack here. So they, they leave beforehand without ever knowing what happened to Carlton or Dave. Then they, they try to find evidence linking her father and the one co-owner. And then Marla comes to tell them that Jason is gone. Pretty much a normal episode of regular show. Normal for their standards. They head back to Freddy's but find the door is welded shut. Luckily, Charlie finds another entrance via the roof from a skylight. Inside, Dave had actually stuck Carlton in one of the spring lock suits. One wrong move and Carlton was a goner. Again, something that could have been easily avoided. Now, somewhere along that time, Dave leaves and Carlton finds himself talking to a yellow Freddy suit with silver eyes. Turns out it's actually Michael's spirit detailing the story of what happened. We're off into the paranormal again, huh? Someone call the Ghostbusters. Charlie and the rest get inside and find Jason in one of the control rooms. After that, Bonnie actually comes to life and targets Charlie, who narrowly avoids him. She's able to find Carlton and free him from the suit, and he tells her that it was Dave who brought all the kids here and stuffed them into the suits. Yep, straight into the paranormal. Here's where it's pure pandemonium. Dave shows up out of nowhere, but uh, Charlie knocks him out with a pipe. Then they spend hours on end trying to run from the animatronics as they can't leave via the roof. They're inside there for an entire day, actually. A day? How do they avoid those things for that long? Well, because it was during the day, the animatronics are calm, just like in the games. It's during the night when they get active. The layout is quite confusing, I will say. I guess it's because there's, is, there's only words to go off of. They go back to Dave to wake him up, but he doesn't reveal any useful information on how to get out, even after putting the yellow Bonnie head on him. I just feel like watching this unfold real time must have been a drug trip for Carlton. 
at least five tabs. Yeah, but Dave himself is obviously crazy. He claims that the kids possessing the animatronics are at home with him and that all of the friends will die because they're adults, but he's safe because he has the suit. They give up asking for answers and keep looking for a way out. This has just been a roller coaster so far. We switch back to Clay, who realizes how stupid he's been when his officer doesn't return. Pulling out an old file on a suspect, he looks through a, a background check and finds an application for Dave. However, Clay puts two and two together and realizes that Dave is just an alias. It's William Afton. So we have our man. I knew Dave had to be involved in everything in some way, but that's still surprising. So William Afton is the purple guy. How is he not dead? Again, uh, discrepancies within the different universes. Now Clay realizes that the background check was for a guard job at the mall and rushes over to the area the kids are at. No wonder Clay couldn't solve this case. Back at the restaurant, Dave, or William Afton, gets free and locks everyone out of the office as it's the only safe place in the whole establishment. He pats himself on the back for being so clever but Bonnie was already in there waiting for him. So the security office in FNAF 1, right? Yep, he set himself up. Deserved. Everyone can hear him scream, but they still have to avoid the other animatronics lurking about as doom falls upon them and it looks like they're all gonna die. Michael shows up in the Golden Freddy suit. Every animatronic stops in their tracks and the group surrounds Michael in a sort of trance. Wait, what? What does that even mean? My guess is that it was like a circle jerk. It was, in fact, not a circle jerk. I hope not. All of a sudden, the walls start to shake, and Clay busts in with a sledgehammer to rescue them. Too little, too late, Clay. The party ended, and we had two casualties in aisle seven. But not all is solved. As they're leaving, William shows up again in the yellow Bonnie suit. He somehow found a way to avoid death from Bonnie. How is he still here? Bonnie can rip me to shreds, but when it comes to his own killer, he's a pacifist? He's a slippery one, that's for sure. Either way, William holds Charlie hostage and refuses to let her leave, wrapping his hands around her neck. This proves to be fatal, as she is able to reach near the head of the suit and set off the spring locks. You should know what happens next. Let's go, Charlie. That's what I'm talking about. Wait, what happened again? She set off spring locks, and it was fatal for who? For William, because he was in the spring lock suit. With William's body shattered, the other animatronics drag him away. That's one way to do house cleaning. As a final note, everyone leaves the abandoned place and goes their separate ways. The story ends as John and Charlie go to visit the graves of her brother and father. And that's the novel. And I have a lot of thoughts right now. Uh, nothing really uh, composed, just a lot of thoughts. So what was the purpose of all this again, besides reading a Marvel comic? To associate names moving forward. While not all names are important, there are some big ones that you'll have to keep in mind, mainly William. Yeah, this just gave me AIDS. At least we know some more information going into the fifth game. Well, funny enough, we actually won't be using most of that information in the fifth game. Yeah, this just gave me AIDS. Before we get into the twisted ones, there is something that I have to show you guys. What is it this time? Let's hear him out. There was one last thing I should have shown in the last sister location video. However, I guess I'm getting too old for my own good. You can say that again. Because of that, I forgot to show that segment. So here we are before we read the novel, ready to bless your eyes with it. Get the bleach, Obama. Father. Father? Excuse me? It's me, Michael. Michael? I did it. I found it. It was right where you said it would be. They were all there. What? They didn't recognize me at first, but then they thought I was you. What is happening? <sighs> and I found her. Her? I put her back together, just like you asked me to. She's free now, but something is wrong with me. What is going on? I should be dead, but I'm not. I've been living in shadows. There is only one thing left for me to do now. What's that? I'm going to come find you. Excuse me, you're gonna what? I'm going to come find you. Was that spring trap? What is going on here? Sense? We don't have sense. We don't have common knowledge. It's all out the window. Nothing makes sense anymore. 
To be fair, I don't think you ever did have a grasp on it. I understand how confusing it can be hearing it the first time. Mm, that's why we'll be having a special guest to help me today. Special guest? What do you mean by a special guest? Did you sneak someone in the building? That suitcase was looking a bit too big today. Our special guest today is no one other than Matt Pat. Hello, Internet. Welcome to Game Theory. <laughs> Matt Pat. And today we're going to look at how Five Nights at Freddy's 36 is actually a parallel dimension to Diamond Freddy's sick mind. Am I in a fever dream or something? Did you just pull that laptop from the wrinkles of your hip? More importantly, what is that? Well, to be honest, I actually couldn't get the real MatPat on the show. I even sent him an executive letter from the Oval Office and he never responded. Goodness, I wonder what his taxes look like. Probably like yours. Anyways, this is some AI that I found online that actually clones someone's voice and gets them to say whatever you want them to. Yeah, that won't cause a bunch of imitation problems. It probably already has. Joe, you're pushing 80. What Geneva laws are you covering up by distracting us? Well, enough shenanigans. Let's start recapping the twisted ones. How convenient. So let's start from the top. Wait, what happened to the mat pat you were using? Oh, I put him back in the suitcase. Call me a kid in FNAF because I'm stuffed in here and it's super hard to breathe. Is that thing sentient? I think anything around MatPat transcends reality. Let's start off hot. Do we need a recap of the last book to make sure we're following along? I suppose it wouldn't hurt. The Silver Eyes was regarding a separate timeline where the main character, Charlie, returns to her old town, Hurricane. She revisits the restaurant where everything happened and ended up in a standoff with William Afton, also known as the Purple Guy. Afton is dragged away by the other animatronics that were there, and they escaped the old mall it was in. You could have just told us that the last time instead of 20 minutes of soap operas. Well, then it wouldn't have been fun. Fun? If you can't have fun reading half of the Greek language, then I don't know what to tell you. It's been a year since the events of The Silver Eyes. The main character of the first book, Charlie, is attending St. Louis University, living on campus with Jessica. John also lives nearby doing some business as a construction worker, and Charlie starts dating him. I guess this really did turn into days of our lives. I'm not gonna question it. We're probably just at the start. One day, Clay Burke, the police officer from the last novel, gives Charlie a visit with some alarming information. He informs her that a corpse had been discovered with familiar wounds. Nothing normal goes on in this franchise. Another one bites the dust. Just as you said, Donald. Now, Charlie confirms the wounds are those uh, of a spring lock failure. Clay also tells her a blood sample from William showed that it was actually fake blood and his body was never found. Don't tell me old Hackensack is still out there. You think death would mean what it says, death? Here's where it gets interesting. On her own, Charlie stumbles upon another body, but this one looks eerily similar to herself. Someone call the Scotland Yard. Once she dials up Clay and reports the body, Clay lets her visit the victim's house. Investigating there on her own, she finds that there are three grave-sized holes in the backyard. She tries to keep this a secret, but eventually it slips to John and Jessica. Yeah, coming across a zombie like it's The Walking Dead should be concerning. Charlie and Jessica go to Freddy's again, which has been half obliterated by a hurricane and hurricane. In a secret storage room, they find William in the spring bonnie suit, completely lifeless. They pull him out to examine him and then leave. Burn him, chop his head off. He's already dead, who's gonna find out? My question is how did some teenagers on psychedelics discover the body, but an elite police force didn't? Also, a hurricane happened in Hurricane. Ironic, isn't it? A tad bit. With the discovery of the body, Charlie begins to have nightmares about Sammy and his spirit draws her to her old house to look for some sort of door. She informs John of this and they decide to take a visit to the house. Okay, so after discovering bodies, she has to conclude that wounds must be linked to Freddy's and she's following the instincts from her nightmares. Is that right? Essentially. Can't wait for them to make a movie about this. Now this one is gonna be a chunk. They find a secret room that was exposed by the storm. In it are three holes and a mound of dirt. From one of the holes, they find a buried animatronic. It looks like Foxy, but a bit distorted. All of a sudden, Foxy springs out of the dirt, comes after them and tries to kill them. They dismantle him 
and he changes appearance to a more normal Foxy. Charlie takes a piece out of him. The device, when turned on, makes him look scarier. What did I just hear? You're telling me we have an actual psychotic robot that just spawned in? That's a lot to swallow. She realized that the device disorients her vision via audio frequencies high enough to force hallucinations on the brain. Charlie and John think Foxy's a monster and see him as such, but kids would see a cartoon mascot. Another piece from inside him is inscribed with Afton Robotics, LLC. Afton Robotics? He's trying to make a robot apocalypse happen. More than that, you're telling me that there was a distorted Foxy in her old house? If that was her old house, why was the chip called Afton Robotics to begin with? I used to ask those questions too, but Joe will just stay stone cold. Anyways, after plotting the victims on a map, they realize that potent animatronics are on the move right towards Charlie's dorm. They, along with Clay, go to the spot that the animatronics should attack next. At the spot, they find three more holes. However, they're each filled with dirt. Charlie digs one up a bit and uncovers the head of another twisted animatronic, this one resembling Freddy. We just need the birds and the bonnie to have the whole gang back together. So out of nowhere, we have killer animatronics just wandering the streets? Straight from Halloween. She realizes the animatronics are actually burying themselves during the day so they don't get seen. Clay evacuates the area, but he overlooks one house, and the person living there gets almost killed by another animatronic, which is introduced as Twisted Wolf. Twisted Wolf? Why is there a wolf now? He should be eating grandmas and knocking down houses, not this! The woman survives, and John informs Charlie that Clay is off to the next place. The animatronic should show up next. Charlie knows the robots are coming for her. So the next night, she sneaks to the place. They should show up next. She thinks they might have something to do with Sammy. Twisted Freddy finds her and captures her, and she ends up in a storage tank. I think this has just turned into my catchphrase at this point, but what is even happening anymore? We went from soap opera to supernatural. It was already a mix of both, but the, this tops the cake so far of wackiness. She just gets shoved in a storage unit like dirty laundry. We're already this deep. Let's just rip the Band-Aid off. At daytime, he buries himself, and Charlie ends up in an abandoned, destroyed restaurant. It looks similar to Freddy's, even having a poster of Freddy and Bonnie. She finds a small balloon boy looking figure. Kill it. She starts hallucinating a bunch of BB-like children chasing her and screaming. She hides in a storage closet filled with new animatronics like a brown rabbit and an ape, along with severed human body parts. She only would have killed it. This is where John, Jessica, and Clay come to her rescue. However, they accidentally let the balloon boys in. Clay whips out his gun and shoots out one of the lights, and the BB-like hallucinations calm down. He shoots out a few others, and the illusion breaks, leaving just a bunch of BB animatronics. I'm going to distort a bullet in my head if I have to hear about more Balloon Boy. Well, load the chamber because the gunpowder explodes now. Oh, boy. William Afton reveals himself, having watched them the whole time, naming himself Springtrap. Of course he's alive. Interesting to rename himself. New pronouns in the same old dirt pile. He outright says he controls the Twisted Ones and can see what they see. Once Charlie and Jessica set him free, he had them bring Charlie here. Charlie asks why he took Sammy, to which he replies, I didn't take him, I took you. He also says he needs something from her. The abandoned diner starts to collapse and Springtrap seemingly escapes as he isn't mentioned after this. Why does he keep existing? Doesn't the universe have a duty to suck him into a wormhole or something? The whole novel previously was about how Sammy was abducted, but William really took Charlie. How would that even work? What sort of oxygen mass memory does she have? The funny gas hits like a truck. Now, sometime before the spring trap encounter, the Withers arrive at the abandoned diner and utterly destroy Twisted Bonnie and Twisted Wolf. As quickly as they came, they left. Twisted Freddy does not get destroyed. Now, the Withered animatronics are referring to the old animatronics, right? And they pull up and destroy the Twisted Ones? An outright gang attack. Remember how I said Twisted Freddy didn't die? Guess who comes back for another fight? I think you already alluded. The entire crew runs away from him as he wrecks shop. They go back out into the lights and everything flutters to bat-like insanity. Everything looks like a cave with spirits flying all over the place. Once the illusion breaks, Charlie finds a secret door, believing it's what Sammy wanted her to find. 
even after everything. That dream is still leading her. The dream got her thrown into a septic tank. You think she would have learned by now? While Charlie is being led, John knows that the whole place is about to collapse, and she'll die if she opens the door. She steps away from it, and Twisted Freddy catches her. Twisted Freddy's head is torn off, but Charlie is captured inside and suffers a spring lock failure in the Twisted One. Turns out she did not learn. Police officers force John and Jessica to leave. The last thing John sees is Aunt Jen holding Charlie's lifeless arm. Wait, she actually dies? I was just joking. The main character dies? Scott must have been eating a fish fillet when writing this. What kind of twist is that? At least she's with Sammy now. Knowing this story, he probably is Twisted Freddy. Here's the last part. John and Jessica meet Marlon Artie, a classmate of hers, in a diner to tell them Charlie died. But then Charlie drives up to the diner, looking very strange. John and Artie share a grim look, and John says, that's not Charlie. William Afton must have ran out of ideas. So what next? That's it. That's where the story ends. What? You're telling me it just ends off there? What about Charlie? What about Sammy? Forget that. Why did R.L. Stein write this book and then threw it to M. Night Shyamalan? I'm actually upset. Now remember, there is a third novel, but we won't be tackling that for a while. So you guys will just have to wait. Quite honestly, you should have kept this one in the vault because now I need to take my aggression out. What even was the purpose of the novel here if it was set in a different universe? What did we learn? We learned more about William Afton and that he operated a company called Afton Robotics. Most importantly, the cutscene that we saw earlier also gives us a slice of context referring to Michael who talks about finding his father. That's it. I'm firing your intern, Joe. I don't think you can do that. He's my intern. Of course I can. Where is he? He's about to cut you off and roll the outro. What the It's kind of funny. I saw this happening eventually, but it's different when you're in the scenario. Back to our reading lessons for the fourth graders. So this is the final graphic novel, huh? At least the one in this specific series. There are others that aren't directly related to the lore, so we won't be reading those. That, uh, that's going to upset the book fair. Well, let's just jump right into it. Recapping the previous novel, our main character, Charlie Emily, was enlisted to track down a series of murders down by Twisted Animatronic. She does that, but at the cost of her own life. However, her friend John sees her approach a diner, but is convinced that it isn't the real her. Trackless for mental illness dropping off the top shelf now. That was an interesting cliffhanger. Now you have my interest again for this entire shebang. Now fast forward a few months later. John, haunted by witnessing Charlie's death, gets fired from his job after a traumatic flashback. That's got to violate some code of conduct. Someone called the Better Business Bureau. While walking down the road, he runs into his friend Jessica, who invites him over to see everyone, including Charlie. He hesitates due to the whole situation with Charlie, but after some thinking, he decides to go. It is a bit suspicious how he saw her literally die, and now everything's just fine and dandy. If she entered Luigi's mansion, she'd be right at home. Now, while at the house, John decides to go back on his decision and tries to leave, but he actually runs into Charlie outside. They have a talk, but it seems like Charlie tries to avoid some questions, and John just decides to leave. Before he does, though, she asks him to meet her the next day. Interesting to what she could be plotting. If he saw her die, I wouldn't trust my eyes either. It's like we're in the wacky world of the bewitched, after all. Later, he drives to Circus Baby's Pizza, which reminded him a lot of the old Freddies. Once John meets Charlie, he actually says something incredibly interesting. John questions whether or not Charlie is actually Charlie. What does that even mean? Well, he directly asks her if she was actually Sammy, her twin that disappeared as a kid. And uh, the reason why John did that was because he couldn't find it possible that she made it through the mess, right? Correct. Now, this obviously vehemently upsets Charlie to the point where she's on the verge of tears. After they calm down, they both agree to go separate ways. And when John leaves the restaurant, he's freaked out by the clowns that surround him from the restaurant and sprints into his car. Cholerophobia must hit hard. Well, I'm not a fan of cauliflower either, so... No way you're being serious. Now, cereal is good. I'll tell you that. Um, anyways, John takes it upon himself to drive straight to Clay's house. Inside that house, both converse over Charlie's family. Then John spots the doll, Ella, in the room with them. Ella? Yes, Ella is the doll that Henry made for Charlie when she was a kid. That's why John found it odd when Clay told him that Charlie found no interest in taking it with her. That, and the fact that more kids are going missing. 
Long Island and Cropsey must be amazed by Hurricane City. While leaving Clay's place, he goes to walk to his car and spots a female clown standing by it. If you can guess, it looked a lot like Circus Baby herself. Circus Baby? Tell her that the plastic surgeon is down the street and to the left. Almost as an attack, the clown launches at him. He gets in the car and yells that Circus Baby's restaurant is in the other direction, and then he speeds off. Wow, John actually listened to common sense. Someone call a doctor. First time for everything. After John leaves, something breaks into Clay's home and attacks him. Maybe she did think that was Circus Baby's restaurant. Yeah, not like it's her restaurant or anything. John visits Clay in the hospital, and he hands some photos over that he took of John and Charlie. After leaving the hospital, Jessica and John end up going to Silver Reef. And that's where they find Charlie's Aunt Jan. I think she was mentioned briefly in the past two books. This is where things get wacky. So buckle your seatbelts. Like it wasn't wacky beforehand. While they are discussing things, there's knocking at the door. Aunt Jen insists that John and Jessica leave through the other room. That's where they find the real Charlie locked in a box. What? What? The real Charlie? So the Charlie that they've been talking to the whole time was just a shadow clone? She's not even from the Hidden Leaf Village. Now, in her own right, Jessica is completely shocked how the Charlie that they have been talking to is not the real Charlie. Back at the house, they lay Charlie on the bed and start going through the pictures that Clay gave John at the hospital. That's when they realize that in every photo, the fake Charlie has been blurred out. Even in one of them, you can see her clown form. We have duplicated Charlie's before GTA 6. 2024 is already starting off terribly. My presidency comes back before GTA 6 comes out. Are you surprised? Your presidency? All of a sudden, the fake Charlie, the one who is pretending to be her, appears in the window. John scurries to help hide the real Charlie, who's still unconscious. Freaky Friday just got freakier. So when you say her clown form, are you talking about Circus Baby? Circus Baby morphs like a ditto, and all of a sudden, we're in the Canto region. To remind you, Circus Baby still takes on the appearance of Charlie. The fake Charlie, or Circus Baby, bursts in, looks around the area, and then leaves. But before she does, John then asks her to meet up later at the restaurant. Circus Baby agrees and leaves. Of course, John goes in to check on the real Charlie, waking her up. So you're telling me that she just popped in for a visit to Grandma's house and that's it? We left the wolf behind in the last novel. Later that night, John goes to meet the fake Charlie at the restaurant and confronts her about everything, including that he found his friend. Circus Baby plays it off and then says goodbye to John. Remember, she's still acting as if she is Charlie. And the real Charlie doesn't know about any of this? Wait, how did she even survive if she got bored by the bear explosion? Good question, but we'll probably find our answer soon enough. After John leaves the restaurant, he meets up with Carlton to discuss what happened. However, he notices Jessica is missing. Funny enough, Jessica got in the fake Charlie's trunk and rides with her to Baby's Circus. You won't ever see me doing this. Or anyone with common sense. Once the car stops, Jessica climbs out of the trunk to see that she's at Circus Baby's Pizza. She goes to the back door and starts looking into the window when she gets attacked by the fake Charlie with her face torn open like the sister location animatronic. Torn open? Yes, remember the jump scares from sister location. Just like that. So after being attacked, Jessica wakes up in a chair bound with a rope on her hands. Circus Baby, who looks like her normal animatronic state, explains to Jessica how William Afton never made anything with love and then goes into detail about how she killed his daughter, Elizabeth. She even states that Elizabeth has become a part of her as the animatronic. Meanwhile, the real Charlie is counting sheep. You're actually right. Meanwhile, the real Charlie is having a dream of a man and a little girl and says she can hear things calling her. A door starts to open and then she wakes up. Marla, Carlton, and John were all there by her side to make sure she was okay. You think that funny feeling would take over for her that something is wrong? It pans back to Jessica, getting free from the rope and standing face to face with Springtrap. She hears a voice and turns around to see none other than William Afton sitting in a wheelchair. This cliche again? Die already. You're not amusing anybody. He explains how he faked his death. But as he's going into detail, Jessica hears a scream. She asks if he's the one kidnapping the children, but he explains to her how he can't do it in the shape he is in. However, he uses the circus baby attraction to bring in tons of people, and it helps them commit the abduction. Then he explains about recreating some machines that come at a greater cost. 
Finally, he shows Freddy, Bonnie, Foxy, and Chica melted together into one, with the children's souls trapped in them. I'm sorry, melted like a Papa John's cheese pizza. Are you saying that they're infused or something? Like a merger, if you can call it that. Souls are not department stores. William forces Jessica to watch Circus Baby take flesh off of him, and she passes out as a result. You know, more and more, this is sounding like a snuff tape. Back at home base, Charlie and the others are figuring out what to do with the chip from the Ella doll. They concoct the idea that the chip can make you seemingly invisible to the animatronics. And now we have Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. I mean, we could use Hagrid for the manpower. Now Carlton ends up taking Jessica's keys to go back to her place to find Charlie's old stuff. While there, he ends up falling under a distortion and Circus Baby attacks him, disguised as Charlie. Luckily, Carlton grabbed the chip from the Ella doll and he was able to activate it. This made him invisible to Circus Baby. He's then able to escape from her clutches. Not today, Voldemort. Meanwhile, Charlie and John talk about the recent events, and that's when it's revealed that Aunt Jen ended up dying in the assaults from Circus Baby. Charlie notes that they have to go back to that place. To a crime scene? More so her aunt's place, but you can call it that. Back at Circus Babies, Jessica ends up waking up next to the kids who have been abducted. She affirms them that help is on the way, and they will get out of this. Jessica's giving out some side character death energy right now. Nobody's fault but her own for literally getting in the trunk. Back at the house, Carlton sprints inside to John and Charlie, explaining to them that Jessica is being held captive at Circus Baby's Pizza. They go over to Aunt Jen's house to look around, and Charlie says her goodbyes to Aunt Jen. I didn't know she was still on the floor like a dying canine. During their visit, they find a letter from Charlie's dad. At the end of the letter, Henry talks about wanting to be with his daughter again. This confuses Charlie because Henry was acting like she died when it was Sammy that died. They also find drawings of the doll, Ella, and a transformation process that appears for the Ella doll to evolve in age. This confuses them as they wonder why William would steal one in the first place. Suddenly, the fake Charlie appears behind them, questioning the same thing as well. Well, that was a lot. So Aunt Jen had drawings locked away of the Ella doll getting older, like a companion for Charlie. Just keep in mind, Ella is the doll that Henry made for her as a kid. Henry and William sound like knockoff Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Back to Circus Baby's Pizza, Marla and Carlton are searching for Jessica and they end up getting attacked by an animatronic. Funny enough, in another room, Jessica and the kids are also being attacked. Everyone escapes, but one kid gets taken in the crossfire. Naturally, the others end up running into each other. Jessica explains to Carlton that Afton is still alive. Chaos emeralds meet the emeralds of chaos. Even Sonic can't even keep up with this. Back at the ant's house, fake Charlie aggressively knocks out John and then shows real Charlie a vision of her father. In the vision, Henry is holding the Ella doll and begins to put the doll inside of what he built to be as Charlie. He was even excited that he got his Charlie back. Fake Charlie explains how she felt abandoned, waiting and waiting for Henry to come back to her. This was due to her being left on almost every single night. What in Terminator did you just say? Built to be as Charlie, get his Charlie back? Good luck, Charlie. I'm with Don here. I'm just outright smacked on the fence of confusion here. Wait till you hear this one. Time for the wrench to be thrown in the drain. Fake Charlie then proceeds to explain to the real Charlie that it wasn't Sammy calling her from behind the door she keeps saying. Sammy doesn't even know she exists. Sammy is actually all grown up and moved away because he never died. She then punches Charlie in the stomach and rips out the Ella doll inside of her. This is the dramatic reveal. Circus Baby, or the fake Charlie, tells the real Charlie that she's actually an animatronic and how her father made her because Charlie was the one that died, not Sammy. Well then. What the actual f did I just hear? Yeah, I was kind of expecting that from you guys. Let me get this straight. We're actually at Hogwarts, and Henry was able to make robots come to life with pure sentience and memories. In this world, yes. This is why the letter from Henry says he wants to be with his daughter again, because she was the one that died. Yeah, I'm lost. Basically, after the death of his daughter, Charlie, Henry was so heartbroken by the fact of losing his daughter that he programmed and engineered an entirely new Charlie. In fact, he even created different forms of her to watch her grow up. This came to backfire on him, though, because once she was a teenager, he realized he had already gone mad. This is where the other Charlie comes in. 
the fake Charlie is actually the soul of another girl, Elizabeth. Elizabeth? Elizabeth Afton? Yes. Basically, William Afton was never free to watch after Elizabeth, so she tried to dress herself up as Circus Baby. We all know the story here from Sister Location, where Circus Baby devours her. This somehow resulted in her soul inhabiting the adult form of Charlie. That's also when Henry abandoned the creation due to his insanity and just kept the teenager Charlie. That's also why the fake Charlie, or in this case, the Elizabeth, is so bitter towards the animatronic Charlie because she had the love from a father that she never got. And somehow I need an Advil. Basically, Charlie disappears, most likely being killed by William, and Elizabeth dies. Henry makes a robot replacement, stops making it before it's an adult, and the Elizabeth's soul inhabits the adult robot. Thus, two Charlies, one's an animatronic and one's Elizabeth. Well, good luck, Charlie, because neither of them are actually Charlie. Now back to the action. As Charlie is crawling away from Elizabeth, Elizabeth goes to attack her before Charlie ends up running into the closet with an animatronic holding a knife. Elizabeth goes in to finish the kill, but Charlie triggers the animatronic holding the knife, stabbing them both and the Elidol. John gets up and sees both of them laying there shanked. Two dead girls die again. Talk about a reboot card. Done seriously? I back at Circus Baby's Pizza, Carlton finds the missing boy, but gets poked with a needle by Afton. This causes Carlton to pass out. He wakes up with all the kids telling him that Bonnie isn't their friend with evil pictures of him. He explains how he's about to hurt someone else. Then, all of a sudden, the melted animatronic gets up and picks Afton entirely off the ground, causing a fire to break out in the restaurant. And there's the arson charge for today. Now, this part could be a bit symbolic. Carlton wakes up and is handed a drawing by one of the kids. There's a bright light in the background and it almost symbolizes like they're going into the afterlife. This could mean that these are the old victims of William Afton, finally freed from the torment. Either that or they were just literal kids. Correct. Carlton then gets woken up by Jessica, Marla, and John while he is in the hospital. Carlton was overjoyed to explain to them all how he helped the kids become free. He then asks about Charlie to which the others don't know where she is or where the fake Charlie is, but then Clay said he'll keep a lookout for them. Not like John saw their bodies or anything. And for the final part, John ends up driving to a gravesite, talking to himself about how Charlie has been his friend forever, just like everyone else. He approaches a grave, somberly looking at it for some time. Coming from behind a tree, a woman who looks like Charlie takes his hand and they both walk away leaving the grave of Charlotte Emily, born in 1980 and died 1983, behind them. And that's it. What's the hieroglyphs behind that? This one is all speculation. The ending is ambiguous on who John walks away with, the robotic Charlie or Elizabeth. But most agree that it was Charlie because of the way the book ended. Wow! And that's how the whole story ends? Yep, the mystery of what happened to Sammy was no mystery at all, just fake memories and alive robots. Will Smith has to be smiling somewhere. Are there any more books we have to worry about after this? Nope, this is the final one. In a way, it concludes a lot more peacefully than we've seen other media conclude. Not as bad as I thought. I still feel like we're missing half of the inscriptions on the tomb, but I really don't mind. You got any of those Advil left on? I sort of understand, but I need a breather after this. We get a big one because there's no more of this for a while. Just the next game. Oh, goody. As long as it's not a battle royale against all these things, I'm fine with that. I really got to stop opening my mouth. It's Donald Trump here wanting to thank all of our members for supporting us. We can't thank you enough. If you would like to become a member and see exclusive content, click the link in the description.